Hey everybody, Daryl Akins here of Anglers All and Umpqua Signature Tire. And I'm gonna be tying the backstabber today, which is a fly from my warm water brother from another mother, Jay Zimmerman. Uh, this is a Gamma SL45, very, very reliable carp hook in addition to, be a bone, in addition to being a bonefish hook. Uh, we're gonna start our thread just behind the hook eye. And we're gonna actually lay down a foundation that's gonna be a visual marker as to where we put our eyes here in just a second. So we're gonna go just to shy the bend, and then we're gonna come back to the eye, and then we're gonna stop and lay a little thicker thread wraps of thread wrap in the middle here. And the reason being is we wanna match the girth of the hook shank to the girth of the eyes that we're tying in. Uh, that way we're giving the eyes a chance to actually grab onto something and not just kinda of spin around on something that's smaller in diameter than uh, the middle of these eyes usually are. So you can see here that uh, I've kind of built a thread wrap right at the middle point. And the middle point is gonna fall just in front of this hook eye. Uh, you wanna go ju the, just behind the hook eye to the uh, bend. And that section of hook shank is what you wanna judge where your middle is. If you start looking to kind of on the bend, it can throw you off and you wanna make sure that you're as close as possible to the middle. So we'd have two things. One, we'll have a very balanced fly. Uh, the balance and, and placement of these dazzle eyes is in direct relation to the weight that's we're gonna get, uh, that's displaced in this hook gap right here. So there's a few things we're gonna do to offset that and to counterbalance this fly and have it turn over for us. First step, eyes in the middle of the hook shank, which will be from there to there. So roughly in front of that hook point, and we're gonna go do a series of X wraps over the shank, under the eyes, tighten, do the same thing counterclockwise. Try and do everything in your power as a tire to avoid wanting to move those eyes with your fingers if they're not straight. Uh, use, uh, think of your, uh, your bobbin and your thread as a wrench almost. You wanna wrench those and pull and move those left or right versus with your hands. If we start moving those eyes with our hands, we're gonna loosen and compromise uh, some of the hard work we did. So I'm gonna go ahead and put some Loon water-based glue on here and we're gonna put the rest of our dry wraps on top of that and let that soak in and make sure we're straight. So I'm very happy with where my eyes are. They're very, they're very tight, they're where I want them to be. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna do a, a few more confidence wraps and cinch this off. Now you can continue on with the 140 or you can even drop down to the UTC 70. Dealer's choice, just keep it black, that does aid in the balance of the color of the fly. What I'm gonna do is actually bring in some 50 denier nano silk and uh, black. And I like the diameter of the nano silk and I also like the strength of the nano silk. So I'm gonna bring that right back to where we were uh, just at the hook bend and we're gonna set up a dubbing loop now. Now I am a double dubbing loop kind of guy you can do one. I tend to do two with a lot of the rubber leg stuff or synthetic stuff I do with dubbing loops. Uh, but this SLF is definitely uh, soft enough to use one. I'm just a habitual tire. So this little bit of wax I'm doing is not anything um, substantial for the actual pattern. It's gonna make sure that if we wouldn't need to move things around within the dubbing loop, uh, that we're able to do that with our dubbing. And what I've done is I've prepared a couple of stacks of dubbing here. And what I'm looking to do is just to kind of make sure that I've got an even distribution for my dubbing loop. So when we spin, I'll be set up to pick out and trim as much dubbing as I can get. If this is off to one side, it's not gonna sp spin and trim as neat. So I'm gonna go ahead and pinch and then preload my, my, uh, my uh, dubbing loop spinner. That way, if I do need to make anything uh, last minute wise adjustment, I can always go in and make it a change. What you wanna do is not have it super tight, um, just back it off a bit and start the first picking or the first layer of picking. And this is gonna allow you to kind of get some of your bigger clumps undone without them biting in and digging in. Uh, you can use Velcro or you can use a brush. I tend to go with both. I do like the wire brush a little better. Uh, this is also another reason why I like doing the, the double dubbing loop is if I get a little physical picking out my double dubbing loop, I'm okay with that. It's not gonna hurt me any. Uh, it's not gonna break 
one, it's nano silk, and two, it's doubled up. So once I'm happy with uh, where we're picked out, I'm just gonna pretty much pull all of my dubbing back as I wrap it, which gives me more dubbing to work with and trim versus some dubbing being trapped. If we have dubbing trapped on the hook shank, we can throw our, the balance off on our fly. So we wanna make sure that we're very aware of where and how we're laying material on in particularly when we're doing carp flies that are engineered to turn over. If I just trap a bunch of material under this, uh, on one side of the hook shank, it's gonna throw the balance off just, just, just enough to where maybe this one fly doesn't wanna turn over how it's supposed to. So when you get up to this point here, you should have just about a half inch of dubbing loop left, and we're gonna use that to kinda go in front of our eyes here. So we're gonna go over, wrap the last couple just like that, and you can go ahead and a couple of spins and then cinch this in. I like to kind of come up where I want to go, a little half itch for security, and then we can pick this out and trim it. Now, this is where Jay started really start like changing how we look at carp flies from a scientific or an engineering point of view. He realized that we had mass that could work against you. So the logic, you would think you would want to keep more on top and less on the bottom. But we have this hook shank to worry about, and this is only doing part of the job. So by adding more mass uh, to the bottom with that top turf, that, that lopsided feel now, it's gonna make it more top heavy, and which is now the top of our fly will be up top. So part all your dubbing to where you have some coming off the bottom and another half going off the top, and pretty much at an angle, cut down and just trim off the top of your fly. And then this one here, you don't want to have this too, too uh, low because I do like, as does Jay, having enough dubbing to cover that hook point. So I just try and like do on an angle just above that hook point. Uh, as our marabou lays over the top here, it'll kind of give this a little bit of a resting bed for some of that marabou as it lays over. So that's going to be the chassis and the basic build with the dubbing loop and the dubbing of this backstabber. And what we have left or a couple of feathers. We're gonna take two marabou feathers here. And Jay thinks about the little details. Uh, so we've got a marabou feather that's gonna come up and kind of peek out with this little section here. And if we kind of look at this an example and start collapsing this, all of the side pieces kind of meet up to that one piece there and it kind of makes everything almost cut off at the end. So if we just go into the middle of our plume, and pull off the top inch or so of that feather, we can minimize the amount of center feathers in that, that equation. So now when all these come up, they taper onto each other to one point versus having almost 50% of that feather in the middle taken away from the taper. So what you're gonna to wanna to do now is take this here. We don't want a ton of mar marabou tied in here. We're only gonna be using a very small amount here right and i do like wetting the marabou it makes it easier to work with uh, i would suggest maybe a sponge so you don't have to wet with your fingers but using something to wet this marabou and tie it in definitely makes life a little easier so we have two hanks of marabou and a hackle feather and this is one of the big reasons that 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 uh, selfishly, as a tire, one of the reasons why having those eyes in the middle allows us a little more space in the front to tie in three feathers. So we're gonna go ahead and get that cinched. We're gonna be tying just over each part of the dazzle eye, which is just off the right of the center. Come up, we'll trim. And again, because we actually took a lot of that feather off that we didn't need, we don't have a ton of bulk there and we are gonna rinse and repeat. We are gonna take our next feather and do the same thing. And you can see how pronounced the middle of those can be sometimes. So by popping that off, we really allow this feather now to shed everywhere. <laughs> Have I mentioned how much I love marabou? It just gets everywhere, I love it. Go ahead and wet it. And we're gonna measure this off the same distance as our other one, so they match. and then very carefully cut off our excess. I like to kind of, before we cinch down, make sure everybody's at the right part of the party. And then we'll slowly kind of ease in 
to behind the hook eye. Now we can clean all this up behind us. Don't forget, I'm on a 30 denier thread, so I've got some, some room here. I'm gonna be all right. India hen and olive is what's gonna kinda of be the front end of this bad boy here. So you can leave a little bit of the gruff on this, a little bit of the fuzzy fuzz on the bottom to kinda of add to the fly. Um, dealer's choice on that one. I'm gonna do the tried and true, upside down triangle. We're gonna paint it back, right? We're gonna tie this bad boy in, old school trout fly style. I like three things here. I'm gonna pull up that triangle, so now I have, I'm going to, uh, basically I'm going to have three total, but right now I have two um, thread wraps on a feather. And this is a great little trick, any hackle feather, uh, to my, kind of keep these in tight. So when you wrap them, they're going to stay in, uh, and then when you fish them, they're not going to come unwrapped. So you're going to always capture in the middle, um, lift up your tag, and do another thread wrap on that side, and then lift your feather up on this side and get a third wrap on the back side. What this will allow us now are three nice tension wraps on the back, the middle, and the front of the tag uh, where we'll be grabbing it. And now uh, just an extra space occupied that's not repetitive. And we're just going to kind of give this a good inline cinch. We're going to support it. And now we'll clean up before we wrap our hackle feather. You can just pull that back. and give it a good base. And then uh, I have rotary vise, but I'm gonna tell you right now, I, I rarely, rarely, rarely use my rotary vise to spin hackle on. I do like having control of what's going on with that hackle feather and spinning it myself. So I'm gonna pull those feathers back, preen them back. I'm gonna roll forward. How many of you have that happen to you? Man, oh man, man. The woes of a tire, right? Regrab, repreen, rewrap. Again, if you have good technique, that feather is not coming undone for you, right? We're just going to continue to wrap and wrap and do that. Yes. Listen, this happens to everybody. Man. Happens to everybody. So what we're going to do is we're going to abandon the, and we're going to go caveman style. We're going to wrap this bad boy like this because I can hold it now as I wrap it forward. So if that's popping off, I can now hold the wraps as they come around until I get to a point to capture. And this is the thing, you're gonna go in front, make sure you capture, pull all of these guys back. And that right there is what we call a tires save. Happens to all of us. All right, so now that our hackle feather's on, we're gonna go ahead and do a little bit of a, a finish here. So here's how I finish my flies. Um, you'll notice to this point, I've used no Zappagap uh, on my fly. I've just used a little bit of the loon uh, and then good technique. Here's how I finish. Uh, and I'm very uh, adamant about this way. I like it. It works. Uh, I'm going to add just about an inch or so of uh, Zap via a brush to the actual thread. And we're going to wrap that around and then we'll whip on top of that. So I'm going to build my head with two series of over-engineered whip finishes. We'll cut that off. Now, normally, and this is one of the exceptions to the rule, normally um, I would take any feather, in particularly uh, any hand or hackle feather, and I'm going to give it the business to really rough it up. Um, however, you have to be very careful on this one because you don't want to rough up your marabou. It's a pretty delicate feather. So I try and avoid any business that I'm about to give this bug on the top side away from the marabou and I'm going to kind of come over and I want to rough up and just give some of these feathers their own independent vibration. And what I mean by that is a feather as it's made is going to be made and engineered to preen water off every time it gets wet. It's just going to roll off and go this way. If we disrupt every one of these individual fibers on this feather, they don't have their buddy next to them to help preen water. So they're all going to vibrate independently and a little differently now because we've separated what they're made to do. They don't have that togetherness. So I like kind of giving these feathers a little bit of something where they vibrate a little differently. Uh, I will let that pass on the front because them laying over the, the, the marabou is going to give us that uh, in general. This is the backstabber. It is a Jay Zimmerman umqua pattern. Uh, we carry these in three colors here at the shop, rust, olive, and black. 
You can tie them up or you can buy them up.